Hi, this is Robert Clickybeard with the Commercial Landscaper Podcast. We're going to take about 30 minutes of your life to deliver some amazing content from accomplished leaders, business owners, to provide you some great Ironman mindsets to help you scale your business, to become a better leader, and push yourself out of a comfort zone into something that's going to stretch you. We hope you really enjoy these shows and encourage you to like and share with your friends, your network, family members, try and get a wider audience and improve our industry. On each show, I'm going to try and pull out one type of Ironman mindset insight that you could take back to your business. And if you're implementing one insight every single week or all the shows, then it's going to make a dramatic improvement to your business. Super excited as well to share that we're partnering up with Boss Business Management Software, which is the ultimate cloud-based solution providing comprehensive insights and tools to optimize performance. Join the Boss community today and transform your business so you too can say, my boss is working for me. Cheers, everyone. Hi, this is Robert Clegg, with the Commercial Landscaper Podcast. Really excited today to be joined by Cameron Harold. Cameron is somebody known for many, many years. We've lost touch for a little bit, but I uh, know each other through EEO and a lot of great friends in that organization. So thank you for joining me today, Cameron. Of course, Robert. Nice to see you again. So Cameron, just for uh, for our audience, I'd love to just know a little bit about your, your background, and I've got a few questions around that, if you don't mind sharing. Sure. And when you mentioned EO, I, I really cut my teeth in the entrepreneurs organization that joined there 30 years ago now. Um, and in my years as a member and working with EO chapters all over the world, I think I've really grown my skills and my confidence, and my connections as a leader. So it's something I recommend that everybody do, regardless of the role you're in, is plug yourself into an industry mastermind community, but also one that is just more of executives that are similar to you. So my background is I was groomed as an entrepreneur. I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs. I was raised to become an entrepreneur by my dad and my grandparents, as were my brother and sister and I. We've all been entrepreneurs for kind of 20 to 25, 30 years, each of us. And then I also have written six books. I've been paid to speak now in 29 countries on every single continent. I got paid to speak three years ago in Antarctica to a group of CEOs. And I started an organization called the COO Alliance, which is kind of like EO, but it's only for the second in command. So we have COOs and presidents of organizations from 17 countries that are members of the CO Alliance. And I also launched a course three years ago called Invest in Your Leaders, which is all the core leadership and management skills that everyone who manages people needs to be good at. And we're rarely trained in those things until you get into a real true enterprise level company where they have training departments and personal development plans and those things in place. So I created that content just to really grow people. Some tremendous experience there. I'm going to take you back to early uh, Cameron days. You talked about your dad being a big influence on their entrepreneurship. You know, I've got young kids, they're all you know, 10, 12 range. What were some of the things you you felt as though your dad helped steer you or was it just observing him? Yeah, it was. So this was back in the era when being an entrepreneur was not cool, right? So for 10 year olds and 12 year olds today, they think being an entrepreneur is cool. Social media talks about being an entrepreneur is cool. The parents think being an entrepreneur is cool. Everybody out there thinks being an entrepreneur is kind of cool. They may think there's a little bit of greedy capitalist there, but it's still kind of like a cool occupation. When I was growing up in the in the early 70s and late 70s, being an entrepreneur, we were vilified, we were greedy, we were capitalists, we were ostracized from family, the schools didn't like us. It was not a cool thing until about 1998 or 99. So 20 years prior, when I was growing up, my father was teaching us to be entrepreneurial giving us the skills to be entrepreneurial, but not necessarily pushing us to be entrepreneurs. But he definitely did show us that being an entrepreneur was better than being an employee because you could do, you could control your time. You could do whatever you wanted, when you wanted, where you wanted. And that was what he focused on as the benefit of being an entrepreneur was to have the free time to really have a great life. It was never about the money. And entrepreneurship now tends to be more about the money, which I think is really hurting people. So in in grooming us to be an entrepreneur, he focused on the skills that we need to be good at, things like problem solving, leadership, being able to think on our feet, delegation, managing time, managing projects, managing our own confidence, um, sales skills, kind of the basics. And he would let us do little businesses and not over-involve himself. And I think often now what parents do, let's say that Bobby wants to have a lemonade stand. Well, they help Bobby make a lemonade stand. They help Bobby do the perfect sign. They create flyers for Bobby that they go down and they get them printed and they bring them home. They help make all the Kool-Aid for Bobby. They stand out on the sidewalk and they wave cars to come in. You know what? 
mom and dad should go run their own damn lemonade stand because Bobby hasn't <laughs> learned anything. Bobby feels discouraged. He feels like his stuff wasn't going to be good enough. He had his ideas, but he had to use mommy or daddy's. Mommy and daddy need to let Bobby go create a crappy little lemonade stand and a crappy little sign, but give him the confidence and then have him come back inside going, nobody's buying my lemonade stand. Coach him from in the kitchen, make him go back out to the curb again, try it for another 10 minutes, come back in, coach him, make him go out. But when mommy and daddy are over-involved on all these kids' businesses, the kids aren't learning. So those are some of the lessons my dad made as he let us run our business ventures. He encouraged us to run our business ventures. He coached us on them, but he didn't do any of the work. Um, yeah, that, that was kind of it. Right. And then giving us the skills to be entrepreneurial. Yeah. No, I love that. Cause even, you know, you, you learn a lot when you go through different failures, whether it be failures in your business or personally, totally. but, uh, when, uh, you know, it looks like uh, back when you're 20, you got into your franchise business painting houses, but it seems like the big catapult for you was when you got involved with Brian and got junk and you, you, you scaled that company tremendously. Is that, is that fair comment? It, it is, yeah. So what happened was I got involved in an organization called College Pro Painters and College Pro was this uh, residential house painting franchise that was operating all over North America and I was so terrified of failing that I memorized their operations manual. They were really good at giving us the systems and the playbooks. And I was so scared of failing that I memorized the manual and I did everything it said. And I've always thought about business and learning the same way now. If I had like my Invest in Your Leaders course, I would take the content, I would study the content, I would do exactly that content, and I would know that I'm going to do better in my role because the person who done it has done it before me. And I think so often the smart people tend to question everything because they're smart and they try to figure it all out. I would just like rip off and duplicate. So if the systems are there, I kind of took those systems and ran with it. And then I didn't have to spend as much time thinking and problem solving and trying to figure it all out. I would just throw my energy and my momentum behind, you know, an easy to implement system. That's where my growth always tend to come from. I also really learned a lot about leading and growing people at uh, College Pro Painters because we went through management training programs. Like I had probably 100 hours training on interviewing and hiring of people. I had dozens of hours of training around time management and project management, around communication, handling conflict, delegation, coaching. So we had this really strong executive training program to give us the skills, very little training on painting houses actually but a lot of training on how to lead teams and lead people and lead yourself. And I think companies are missing the opportunity right now and, and even leaders to be that self-driven learner. Go and check out the Invest in Your Leaders course. Grab a, a great business book. Watch some podcasts and, or listen to some podcasts. Watch some videos and try to grow your skills and your confidence so that you can show up taking on more responsibility and then try to bring some of those systems inside your company. That's how you get promoted too. You get promoted by being that self-driven learner who's trying to grow the organization versus trying to build a silo. What do you think the barrier is for you know, somebody being hired to that second in command or being promoted into that position and then just stopping there? Do you think it's just that they check that box and figure they'll, they'll coach them while they're on the job or they'll figure things out? What, what do you think the barrier is? And, sorry, and the barrier was was somebody coming into a role and then not promoted? Yeah, if you come into the role, being promoted to a, like a second in command, like a CC yeah. type level, but then the, the owner or business is not investing in that person. Oh, yeah. No, in I, terms of the courses or education or learning. Oh, it's, a it's a huge mistake, a huge problem. I think often entrepreneurial companies, the entrepreneur or CEO will have a CEO coach. They'll be in a CEO mastermind group. They'll read books. They'll talk to other business leaders. They'll grow their skills and confidence and connections, but they miss the opportunity to grow the skills and confidence and connections of their leadership team. The real replication and growth comes from growing the skills of people. So what I've always believed is that a leader's core job is to grow people, right? The, the VP or the CEO or COO or CMO, whatever your title is, if you're managing people, your job is not to do work. It's to grow the skills and the confidence and the connections of people so that they can do more work that's more predictable at a better ROI than paying you to do work, right? Our job is to get results through others. Do you think it's um, the feel threatened? You, I'm trying to figure out why, why are people sort of almost like put them in that box? I think they get not? dizzy. 
I think, you know, we're, we're in, a, we're in a, t- a time period now where business is changing, stuff is growing, stuff is moving, things are iterating, competition, changes in the economy. It's like everything's faster, lots of communication with Slack and email. So what happens is business people and executives are busy being busy. They're running as fast and as hard as they can. In many ways, they're like the fly trying to bang their head on the window, and they're going to keep working harder until they get out that window, and they end up dead on the windowsill. Because they don't stop and look around and go, oh, there's a door right here that's open. I'll just go out the door. (laughs) And I think that's what happens to many business leaders, many COOs, many CEOs, is they're so busy in the business, working in the business, doing work, instead of stopping and saying, wait, I'm going to delegate this to everybody. Oh, I can't delegate it because they don't have the skills. Good. I'm going to delegate it anyway, and I'm going to spend my time growing their skills and confidence so that, oh, they can do more of that so that it frees me up to think to inspect what I expect, to see the bigger picture, right? To, And that's where leader, the really, really good leaders are the ones that are growing people and have free time to think and be strategic and make connections and see what's happening outside the industry and then come back in to delegate more and grow people's skills and confidence more. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Going back to your days with um, God Jones, obviously you tremendously scaled that business. What were some of the things that you learned? Because I think you started off when you was only... A small number of franchises, and then you grew it to I'm trying to find, find the numbers here. But yeah, there was there was twelve locations when I showed up, and uh, when I left, we had three hundred and thirty. So you know, to go from twelve locations to three hundred and thirty is pretty crazy growth. We went from two million in system wide sales to to one hundred and six million in system wide sales in six years. And we went. I was employee number fourteen at the head office, and when I left six and a half years later, we had. 3,100 employees system-wide. Wow. That's and and to, to scale that, what we did and what I focused on was three things. The first was that I wanted to try to turn the company flywheel. And the flywheel was all around culture. Is I wanted to build something a little bit more than a business, a little bit less than a religion. And if we could get into that zone of a cult, our employees would be happier They would join us faster. They wouldn't quit their jobs. We'd have lower training costs, higher retention, more word of mouth, more productivity. That flywheel would go, right? And the better the culture was, we could attract better people. We could grow. We could pay people more. So we really focused on the culture flywheel was number one. Number two is we focused on making sure that we grew the skill sets of people. It was all around, again, growing the skills and confidence of our people. So training them on all the skills in the Invest in Your Leaders course, certifying people in those skills, constantly working to grow their skills and confidence because we knew that every year the company was doubling in size, which meant the skills of our people had to double every year too. And if we couldn't get ahead of the curve, we were constantly going to be firing them having to replace them, having to train them, which would hurt our culture, hurt our productivity. So we got ahead of the curve by growing the skills and always growing the skills of the people, which meant we needed to think about what skills are needed a year out and two years out so we could backfill that and reverse engineer that skill development. And then number three was we realized that we had no money for marketing, so we leveraged getting free publicity, getting on radio shows, TV shows, Mm -hmm. magazine articles, newspaper articles. We were on Oprah. Now it's like you know being on podcasts. Anytime you can get the media to talk about you, and then you can share that content with your audience, with your listeners, with other media, that flywheel starts to take over and it doesn't cost much, right? Me being on your podcast is an hour of my time. Me being on your podcast is good. It'll get me exposed to your community, but I'll take your podcast episode. I'll share it with my email list. I'll share it with my press list. I'll share it with my online. I'll share it on social. I'll put it on my website. It'll have backlinks for SEO. So there's all these additional values that I can leverage off PR. We built a really strong PR flywheel inside of 1-800-GOT-JUNK, and we landed 5,200 individual unique stories about our company in six years. And that was before Facebook even started. So we had no social media to share all the PR, but we landed 5,200 stories, individual uniques in six years. That's awesome. Congratulations. Uh, Karma, the going back to your got junk. You know, you're you're trying to develop that training program. There's so many companies that go in and coach, and they talk about we want to develop a training program, leadership development, but it just falls flat. They never actually have that effort or have that start that flywheel per se. Um, how, how did you start that within God Junk? I mean, you obviously have some good background there, but what were some of the early steps you took to just to get that flywheel going? Yeah, so the first was just understanding how leaders actually grow. 
right? So how do, how do adults actually grow? Well, adults grow from learning the, con- the concept, from practicing the concept, from using the concept, and then from thinking about the concept later. So if you understand that's how leaders grow, then you can kind of build a training program around a little bit of that growth so that they can actually, you know, grow. The third part is remembering that people are visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. So some people learn from watching, some learn from doing, and some learn from actually, you know, um, listening and reading. So you have to build a training program that incorporates all three so that you hit people's primary and secondary learning style. So I understand adult learning and principles. I even teach that in my Invest in Your Leaders course. In the the module on classroom teaching, I teach how to build training programs internally so that you can train your own people. The second thing that we looked at was what are the core skills that every manager and every leader needs to be good at to get results through people? So they have to be good at situational leadership. They have to be good at coaching. They have to be good at running one-on-one meetings. They have to be good at delegating projects. They've got to be good at project management. They have to be good at time management. They have to be good at managing email and Slack communication, handling conflict. They have to be good at looking at the CEO's vision and reverse engineering that. They have to be good at interviewing people and running meetings. Those are kind of the executive functioning skills that everybody needs to be good at. Yes, they need to be good at marketing if they run marketing. And yes, they have to be good at IT if they run IT. And yes, they have to be good at using software. But no one ever trained them on the executive functioning skills. So what I looked at was a leader's core job is to grow people and to get stuff done through others. Those are the core skills they need to be good at. That became the core curriculum that I decided on. And yes, we had curriculum for other parts of training. Like we trained the guys how to drive trucks and how to do specific marketing tactics. And so we trained people on what to do. I focused on training people how to do. Now, you've you've now got on and built another great organization with CEO Alliance. Tell us a little bit about that. How many companies or you know people you work with? The sure. So we just had, our, just had our 500th member just join. Um, I noticed years ago that there were a lot of groups for entrepreneurs out there. You know, you've got the Entrepreneurs Organization or EO. You have YPO, which is Young Presidents Organization. We have Vistage. We've got the Genius Network and Baby Bathwater and War Room and Go Abundance and all these amazing groups for entrepreneurs. And then there's events for marketers and lawyers and engineers and dentists and doctors and neurologists. There's all kinds of industry events for for everybody. There was nothing for that second in command. So what happened is COOs kept going to the next closest thing. We kept going to events for entrepreneurs, but we didn't fit in. And it's kind of like a guy showing up at a baby shower. It's cute, but we don't really belong. It's supposed to be the women with the kid. Like it's, it's just, that's just the DNA that's supposed to be at the baby shower. And we realize that we don't fit as soon as we walk into the room, right? Or it's like the woman who wants to go to the bachelor party. Yeah, she can hang out. She'll go see strippers. But then all of a sudden she's like, you know what? Uh, this is a dude thing. Like I shouldn't right. be at a dude thing, right? <laughs> well, COOs are not like COOs are not like CEOs. We think differently. We perceive the business differently. We operate differently. We solve problems differently. We communicate differently. We have different personality profiles. So we don't have a space in their room. We, when we go into their room, we feel like we're the odd one out. So I started the COO Alliance as a network of second in commands. We now have members from 17 countries and we meet every month for two hours online every month. And then we meet in person every year, once at MIT's Endicott House in Boston and once in Vancouver, Canada. And we get all these COOs together to meet in person, to work through issues together, to collaborate together, to learn each other's skills. And it's not me teaching them as much as it is me getting them all together to learn and facilitate and collaborate with each other. And it's a way for them to grow their confidence, their connections, and their skill set so that they can be better leaders and so that they can grow their company. And then membership on that is only 4900 a year. So it's you know, reasonably, easily priced for any company to put people into. And by the way, no entrepreneurs are allowed to, to come. Like we don't allow the CEO in the room. So they're able to talk freely, to talk through challenges. It's kind of like if, if you get five guys together and then you invite three women, the conversation changes. If you can get five guys together to talk about relationships and being a better man and showing up with better polarity, guys will actually go there but you need to give them the space to go there. Well, that's what we're doing with the COOs is giving them a space to grow without the CEO influencing that conversation. And sometimes the conversation is, my CEO is crazy, and I love that my CEO is crazy. How do I help my CEO embrace their crazy? How do I be the leash to their crazy dragon without choking them? Or how do I be the brakes to their gas without being the parking brake? You know, because every COO wants to do well in their role, and we need space to be able to talk to other COOs of what they're doing with their crazy ADD, bipolar, 
you know, <laughs> on the spectrum CEO, right? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Tell, tell me some success stories you've seen over the years. I mean, 500 members is tremendous. You must have seen some really good, you know, rising stars or people that have gone oh, into. Yeah. We have like one of the, on one year, one company went on to rank as the number two company to work for in the United States on Glassdoor. And another member of ours went on to rank in that same year as the number 12 company to work for in the United States on Glassdoor. And on the same year, another one went on to rank number one to work for in the state of Ohio. So very high kind of culture index, culture focus for a lot of them, which has been really powerful. We've watched a number of our COO members move into the CEO role, which is not very common at all. But we've watched a lot of them grow the skills and confidence and probably just even some inductation from being around me as more entrepreneurial COO. They were able to learn that and move into the COO role. Definitely saw like a lot of um, camaraderie where behind the scenes, they were there helping COOs go through tough times, going through an acquisition, going through um, folding of a company, going through like being acquired, where they were all there backing each other up and providing input and connections and help to each other outside of the normal meetings. That that was pretty powerful to watch them start their own little forum groups even. What, what does uh, the future look like for your company. My wife and I are both kind of tired of being just around the North American audience and, we, and North American mindsets, and we wanted to explore the rest of the other 191 countries, right? There's only, <laughs> two, between the U.S. and Canada, we got two of the 193. We want to check out the other 191 and get to know the people and the, the way that they think and the way that they act and the way that they live and what do they do for fun and, and how do they approach politics and how do they approach, you know, yeah, everything, um, relationships and, and friendships and hobbies and sexuality and psychedelics. And so we're, we're just plugging ourselves into all of these different groups all over the world to get a more global experience in our life. I don't, I'm not sure if you knew John Ruland. Did you, did you happen to know John from? Yeah, yeah I do. Yeah. John passed away three days ago. Um, John and I have been oh, close, very close personal friends for 17 years. We met at the EO 20th anniversary. You know, I, I have a very, I'm lucky to have a very global network of friends now, but that's something we're looking at doing is how do we expand our really close friendships with really cool people doing real cool stuff, but maybe they're based in Greece or maybe they're from Italy or maybe they're from London or from South Africa. So we're trying to just plug ourselves into the global audience and the global narrative uh, and chase down our bucket list items. And then, yes, at the same time, build the COO Alliance to continue to be a global organization for second-in-commands from all these different countries. Business is so global now, too. Especially the last few years, you know, during COVID and everything going online. What were some of the, I know we're getting finishing up here in a couple of minutes, but what are some of the things you've noticed with other cultures and how they operate their business and just operate maybe slightly different than the North American market? The big similarity is that we're all humans and we all struggle with the human condition of, you know, life and family and worry and insecurity and relationships and growing kids and money like we all and health like we all have those same issues. Caring about employees tends to pay off globally. Uh, that's a big one. The differences are things like the, the culture around drive and energy and how fast people make decisions. In Italy, it takes forever to make a decision. In the UK, people are more reserved and a little bit more inclusive. In Germany and Switzerland, everyone shows up on time for every meeting and they finish every meeting and everyone delivers projects on time. No one misses expectations. Like everything is just deliver what you promise is normal. And in the U.S., it's a lot more around culture and bravado and the cult of leadership and social. And that doesn't exist in, you know, Latin America. It's it's not about that at all. Yeah, it's, it's that. The other, the one big thing I've noticed that's drastically different is in, in the United States specifically, and Canada certainly following suit, and maybe a little bit even in the U.K., is there's a lot of focus around work and people working and what you're doing for work and what do you do for work and where do you work and what do you do? In the rest of the world, no one cares about that. In the rest of the world, they care about friends and relationships and hobbies mm -hmm. and how their soccer team is doing. And they they spend a lot more time on life and having a good life and having connections with each other. And the U.S. don't even know what to do with vacation time. You know, in Europe, six weeks vacation is normal. In the United States, two weeks is a lot for some people <laughs> because they don't they don't have any life. They have no connection to what really matters outside of that. And I think that was what really touched me with John Rulin when he passed away four days ago was that 
He's always cared about friends and family. He and I spoke a week ago over video for 45 minutes, and he was talking about his girls and how much he loved his girls and how much he was working on his relationship with his wife, like all the shit that matters. And then 43 minutes into the call, we talked about business. I think that's something I've noticed that's very different. Well, very sorry to hear about John. I met him several times, a great guy. Um, and, and I can relate to when I first moved from the UK to the States, you know, when the first few questions, people asked me what I would do. Whereas mm-hmm. back in the UK, it's all about family, uh, hobbies, you know, pubs, whatever yeah. the case may be. So, did you yeah, watch the game totally last to, weekend? Like, I know, not even, not even, football. yeah, yeah, not football, even did you watch game. the game, but like, what did you think of that stupid play? That someone, like, no one cares about what we do, and, and I think I really want to bring that mindset back into North Americans more now. And is work is not your hobby. It's great that you enjoy what you do, but you don't want to hear a lawyer talk about being a lawyer and you don't want to hear a dentist talk about being a dentist. You don't want to hear a, a chiropractor talking about being a chiropractor. No one wants to hear you talk about your business either. What we want to hear about is your life and your activities and your hobbies and your bucket list. And I'm glad that you enjoy what you do, but it's boring for everybody else. So, and I think I think at the end of the day, if you drop dead at 45 years old, is that really how you wanted to spend your entire life? Or would you have rather had had more time with your four little girls or more time with your spouse or more time with your friends? I think John was fairly balanced, but I think a lot of people are not. Yeah, that makes you real. Makes you real. Cameron, how can uh, people get in touch with you, find out about what your offerings, your courses, your books, and you've got a whole yeah. list of things to offer? Definitely take a look at investinyourleaders.com. That's my leadership course. So it's investinyourleaders.com. All of my resources on coaching, group coaching, speaking, everything is on this, the Cameron Herald website. So it's Cameron, H-E-R-O-L-D.com. And then all of my books are available on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes. And then check out the Second in Command podcast uh, anywhere you listen to podcasts, too. We've just had our 400th episode went live. Awesome. Yeah, I know some good uh, clients of mine that are avidly listening to your podcast all the time. So uh, awesome. you do a good job there. So Cameron, it's been an absolute pleasure. Talking to you, seeing you again. Congratulations on your success. And uh, I look forward to keeping in touch with you. Thanks, Robert. Great seeing you again. Thanks for having me. Okay. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Hopefully that was pure dead brilliant for you today and you got some great Ironman mindset takeaways for your business or your leadership role. This is Robert Clickabeard. Love to get you, your friends, your employees to join us in our future journey. So please subscribe to your various podcast channels. Visit our website, commerciallandscaper.com or wilson-360.com. You could check out our digital courses. You could check out to peer groups, coaching, my book, Ironman Mindset for Entrepreneurs. And we just want you to have a pure, dead, brilliant day. And finally, my thanks again to Boss Business Management Software, which is the ultimate cloud-based solution providing comprehensive insights and tools to optimize performance. Join the Boss community today and transform your business so you too can say, my boss is working for me. Cheers, everyone.